Welcome to the World Championship Round of the 2023 Philip C. Jessup International Law Moot Court Competition. Everyone in this room has worked so hard to get here. Everyone, judges, students, coaches, spouses, children, parents, just about everyone else, hotel employees. And this is the moment we've all been waiting for and we couldn't be prouder of the two teams that sit here before us and will soon be standing here before us. Can we have one last round of applause for them? Tonight at 9 p.m. we'll have the closing gala of this event where we'll also be passing out a lot of awards and they are exciting this year. In a moment, the bailiff will call all rise. The judges will come in through the back door and take the podium. I think by now we're all pretty familiar with what happens after that for the next 90 minutes. The judges will then retire to their room. We don't leave the room at, at this level, we, we stay seated. While they are deliberating, we'll have a couple of awards to give out, including one very exciting one. Uh, and then uh, the judges will return. We'll get a high sign and they'll come back in. We will all rise again. And the judges, you'll be pleased to know, will deliver the judgment from the courtroom. At this time, and this is my final order of business before we watch this very exciting match, can I ask everyone in the room to please check your mobile devices, your portable fax machines, your coffee machines, whatever you have, to make sure they are in silent mode. And again, the two teams up here, no computers, no electronic devices at all. So that's all I have. Have a great match. All rise. The International Court of Justice is now in session. President Sebotinde and the Honorable Judges Abraham and Mamba presiding. Please be seated. The case before the court is the case concerning the Clarion Belt. The parties are, are applicant, the Kingdom of Aguavel, and respondent, the state of Ragnar. The applicant and the respondent are each allocated 45 minutes to present their pleadings. Good afternoon. Uh, the court meets today to hear the case uh, concerning the Clarent Belt with the Kingdom of Aglovale as the applicant and the State of Ragnar as the respondent. So I'll now call upon the agent of the Kingdom of Aglovale to address the court. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam President, Your Excellencies, may it please the court. My name is Lu Yujing. Together with my co-agent, Zhao Xinyi, and of counsel Sophie Su, we represent the applicant, the Kingdom of Aglobel. I will speak for 22 minutes, and my co-agent will speak for 21 minutes. We respectfully reserve two minutes for rebuttal. 
Yikes, Lizzy. We stand before you today because Ragnar has continuously violated its obligations on the Richard's team. It's so true to balance of entitled the current act for the city of Dax and environmental damages. Moreover, it ordered the UN city tenants to transport hundreds of parking lakes to Atlanta and transfer them to a maximum security country. Committed to monitoring compliance with the city, I wrote out enacted sanctions legislation to deter Ragnar's illegal action and the condition of cooperation with his management on the termination of Ragnar's illegal action. Your Excellency, I will be dealing with the first and second issues, and my creators will address the third and the fourth issues. For the first issue, the applicant makes three arguments. First, Ragnar's military operations violated Article 2, Paragraph 1 of the Peace Treaty by violating the principle of non user force. Second, Ragnar's illegal use of force cannot be justified by self defense. And third, Ragnar breached Article 2, Paragraph 2 of the Peace Treaty by violating the principle of free forces under international humanitarian law. Bringing them to our first argument. Actions by regular armed forces across an international border constitutes a breach of the principle of non-user force, as identified by this court in the 1986 Protocol Organization. In our case, with the initiation of Operation Chinese, Ragnar's military forces enter the belt, balance of intelligence, and further conducted two attacks in the belt. On this basis, we submit that Ragnar breached the principle. Moving on to our second argument concerning self defense. The applicant submits that respondents cannot invoke the right of self defense. This is because a state is not entitled to exercise the right of self defense if it is sought to arm acts from non state actors when the action of the non state actor is not attributable to the pure state. In this court's 2004 World Rights Day opinion, this court articulated that the right of self defense is good in case of an armed attack by one state against another state. This indicates that armed attacks from non state actors, which are not incapable to a state, they are not giving rise to the right of self defense. Consequently, <coughs> it is that we urge this court to find. <laughs> Yes, I'm going to ask you a question. Are you referring to the law of self-defense and the constitutional law of Indeed, Your Excellency, we do acknowledge that the right of self-defense is not only provided in Article 51 of the UN Charter, but it is also a customary international rule. And based on this court's Nicaragua case and nuclear weapons advisory opinion, the customary inter there, there are distinctions between the treaty law of self-defense and the customary international law of self-defense. First, the customary international law of self-defense does not mention the duty to not invoke the right of self-defense, no matter the uh, self-defense under the treaty law or the customary international law, because the prerequisite is that there should be an armed attack from a state. And the respondent may refer to state practices after 9-11 to argue that there is a new customary rule supporting self-defense against non-state actors. However, Your Excellencies, we submit that there are no widespread and uniform state practices in this regard. And we point this court to the 2021 Area Formula meeting, in which states such as Mexico, Brazil, Sri Lanka expressly opposed self-defense against non-state actors. On this basis, we submit that customary international law does not support self-defense against non-state actors. If your excellencies have no further questions concerning self-defense, I will move on to the second argument concerning... Thank you. 
I would like to follow my, right. my previous uh, question. Right. Uh, you are arguing that uh, the respondent has uh, reached the right uh, of uh, prohibiting the use of force, except in the case of self-defense. Okay, I understand that. But what is exactly the link with the peace treaty? Because I insist the jurisdiction of the court is based on the peace treaty. So simply tell me what is the link. Your Excellency, Please. yes, Your Excellency. First, article, uh, first, the principle of non-use of force is, is incorporated to peace, this peace treaty because according to paragraph two, paragraph, uh, article two, paragraph one of the peace treaty, all parties should follow the, pr pr follow the obligations on the United Nations Charter and the customary international law governing friendly relations among states. And this court has confirmed that the principle of non-use of force is a customary international law in its Nicaragua decision. And um, if, if your excellencies have no, yeah, thank you. And I will now turn to our argument concerning international humanitarian law. We submit that Ragnar's compound Arden attack has breached the principle of precautions under Article 57 of Additional Protocol 1. Article 57 of Additional Protocol 1 provides that parties must do everything feasible to verify that the targets are military objectives rather than civilians. And even if there is only slight doubt, the commander must call for additional information. And according to ICRC commentary, information must be gathered through various means. In our case, Apart from the maps and cell phone photographs provided by, by the unreliable Blaney informants, Ragnar merely relied on its drone footage. But the drone footage was not a proper precaution. First, it was outdated, because according to paragraph 48 of the facts, that the 76 victims went to hide in the compound several days ago. This indicates that the drone footage was at least several days old. Second, Drone footage or area surveillance may easily misidentify the targets. In this regard, we will appoint this court to Israel's practice in the 2014 Gaza conflict. Israel's area surveillance misidentified figures running into a compound as militants, even though they were actually children. In light of these factors, in light of this, we submit that Ragnar has breached the precautionary principle. If your excellencies have no further questions, I will turn to our second issue regarding UAC detainees. C can I just ask one question? Maybe I should have asked it at the beginning. Uh, as far as the applicant is concerned, what is the basis of the jurisdiction that we're dealing with here, of the court's jurisdiction? Very briefly, what is the basis? Your Excellency, according to Article 36, Paragraph 1 of the, P of the ICJ statute, Parties to a treaty can invoke the dispute settlement clause within this treaty to request this court to adjudicate upon the dispute. And here, Article 51 is the dispute settlement clause within the Dispeace Treaty. And a, but, yes? So the, the basis, just basically, very briefly, you can tell me the basis for the jurisdiction is this provision or that provision? Yeah, That's all. Yes, Your Excellency, it's Article 41 of the Peace Treaty because both Ragnar and Aglobel invoked Article 41 as the jurisdictional basis. And this is supported by paragraph 61 and 62 of the agreed facts. If your excellencies have no further questions, I will turn to the second issue regarding UAC detainees. In this regard, the applicant acknowledges that UAC's declaration has been accepted by the Swiss depository, which has turned UAC into a party of an international armed conflict. And according to Article 44 of Additional UAC detainees should be deemed as prisoners of war and be protected by the Third Geneva Convention. And we further make two arguments. First, the employment of UAC detainees violated Article 52 of the Third Geneva Convention. Second, the detention of UAC detainees in Kamlan Correctional Center has breached Article 22 of the Third Geneva Convention. Judge, Judge Mumba has a question for you. 
Uh, yes, um, Hansel, since you are uh, discussing the UAC um, group, the way they were treated, the way they were taken, I just want to find out whether the crossing of the international border from the belt to Ragnos territory um, affected their status. Um, your Excellency, could you please rephrase your question? Yes, the transfer of the UAC detainees from the belt into Ragnel. I'm asking whether the fact that they crossed an international border affected their status. Your Excellency, we submit that the transfer of the UAC detainees also violated Article 47 of the Third Geneva Convention. And we will first address our argument concerning the employment of UAC detainees. Mm -hmm. Article 52 of the Third Geneva Convention provides that unless they volunteer to do so, prisoners of war cannot be employed on unhealthy and dangerous labor. The respondent may point to paragraph 44 of the facts, which indicates that Ragnar has provided UAC detainees with basic safety gear, such as masks and gloves. However, according to ICRC commentary to Article 52 of the Third Geneva Convention, whether a work is dangerous or unhealthy depends on the nature of the work instead of external conditions such as protection provided. And we know from paragraph 38 of the facts that the waste was contaminated by C. diff and MRSA. The infections of C. diff and MRSA will significantly increase all-cause mortality as supported by WHO's global report on infection control and prevention. On this basis, we submit that the transport of medical waste was an unhealthy and dangerous labor. The applicant further submits that Ragnar forced UAC detainees to perform this work. According to ICTY's Nalitili case, in order to measure voluntariness, the general circumstances under which the detainees were put should be taken into account. And we should look at whether these detainees were in a vulnerable position or not. In our case, we see that Ragnar was able to carry out large-scale bombings in the belt. By contrast, UAC fighters were guerrillas who only had little access to arsenal, and the only tunnel mouth they relied on to get access to weapons was destructed. On this basis, we submit that UAC detainees were in a vulnerable position and they did not perform this work voluntarily. This is also further... Jackson, do you have a question? Yes. Uh, Judge Abraham? Just one question. The UAC fighters, detainees, uh, are not nationals of your country, if, I, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Does it change anything about the standing of uh, the uh, applicant states on this point? Your Excellencies, we do note that UAC fighters were not Aglovalian nationals, but we still submit that Aglovel has a standing to bring this claim because of obligation Elga Omnes Partes. According to this court's 2022 Gambia versus Myanmar case, a state is entitled to bring a claim because of another state's breach of obligation Elga Omnes Partes to protect collective interests. And according to ILC's commentaries to the draft articles on state responsibility, such obligations can derive from multilateral treaties that set standards to protect a group of people. On this basis, we submit that the applicant has a standing to bring this claim. Sorry, in this case, what do you mean by erga omnes partes? Your Excellencies, we submit that the peace treaty enshrines obligation erga omnes partes because it reflects the collective interests of the three states. The three states, okay. Yes, Your Excellency. Thank you. And, and we submit that okay. Ragnar's employment of the UAC fighters has breached Article 52 of the Third Geneva Convention. Okay. Turning then to Article 22 of the Third Geneva Convention, Article 22 provides that prisoners of war cannot be detained in penitentiaries unless this can be justified by the prisoner's own interests. And according to ICRC commentary to Article 22 
of the Third Geneva Convention, even if the conditions in penitentiaries are materially better, prisoners of war cannot be interned in penitentiaries because this will be an affront to their, to their military dignity and honor. Here, according to paragraph 49 of the facts, Ragnar transferred about 1,000 UAC detainees to a maximum security prison located in the territory of Ragnar. This cannot be justified by the interests of the prisoners of war, because at least Ragnar could have transferred these UAC detainees to places other than penitentiaries. On this basis, we submit that Ragnar has breached Article 22 of the Third Geneva Convention. Turning then to Article 47 of the Third Geneva Convention, we submit that the transfer of UAC detainees was breached this article because Article 47 of the Third Geneva Convention provides that if a combat zone is, a, is drawing closer, prisoners of war cannot be transferred when the transfer cannot be carried out safely. And according to ICRC commentary, this entails an ex ante evaluation of the circumstances. The transfer cannot be carried out when the detaining power has reasons to believe that it will be able to resist the invading power and the transferring of the UA and the transferring of the prisoners of war would merely expose them to danger. In our case, as we have submitted, there was power discrepancy between UAC fighters and Ragnar because Ragnar was able to conduct large scale bombings while UAC were simply blending guerrillas. On this basis, we submit that Ragnar has reasons to believe that it could resist the UAC fighters. And the transfer of these prisoners of war would simply expose them to the danger. On this basis, we submit that Ragnar has breached Article 47 of the Third Geneva Convention. If your excellencies have no further questions, this concludes my submission. May it Thank please you. the court. Thank I now you. yield the court to my colleague. <laughs> Madam President and your excellencies, may it please the court. My name is Zhao Xingyi, and I appear on behalf of the kingdom of Aglaville. In the next 21 minutes, I will address the third and the fourth question presented before this court. The third, on Aglaville's sanctions imposed against Ragnall in order to induce Ragnall to comply with this treaty obligation. And the fourth, on Ragnall's transboundary movement of hazardous plastic waste and Aglaville's cancellation of the waste transfer negotiation in response to Ragnar's bombing on the NAND gateway. Now we first turn to the third issue on Aglaville's sanctions. Your Excellencies, Ragnar's illegal attack on NAND gateway and later on the compound Arden have endangered the safety of Aglavalian nationals and brought about severe economic consequences. In order to deter Ragnar from continuing its military operation, Aglavalian Parliament enacted sanctions legislation against Ragnar. Based on these facts, Your Excellencies, we submit that it was a lawful act under the peace treaty, and Aglaville shall bear no international responsibility in this regard. Now, in this issue, we made three arguments. First, Aglaville did not breach the non-intervention principle, which is a rule under customary international law governing friendly relations among states provided by Article 2.1 of the peace treaty. Second, Aglaville did not violate the most favored nation principle of WTO agreements, which is an applicable principle of international law governing free trade under Article 2.3 of the peace treaty. And thirdly, the applicant complied with its human rights obligations under Article 2.2 of the peace treaty. In respect of the non-intervention principle, Your Excellencies, since political and economic influences are common in international relations, there will be no breach of the non-intervention principle unless 
the intervening state used a method of coercion. The critical element of coercion, Your Excellencies, follows from this court's jurisprudence in the 1986 Nicaragua decision. But here, in this case, the element of coercion was absent. Your Excellencies, the applicant did not use force, and the threshold for non-forceable interference to amount of coercion is relatively high. Now, as this court observed in Nicaragua decision, economic sanctions such as trade embargo and huge reduction of import quota were still unable to be regarded as coercive. And it has been stated by the 1970 Friendly Relations Declaration that being coercive is to overbear and subordinate the exercise of sovereign rights in the intervened state. However, Your Excellencies, there was no overbearing of sovereign wills caused by Aguilaville sanctions. Despite Aguilaville's trade embargo, Ragnar was still able to maintain its foreign trade partnership, as was reflected from President Vordiger's public address at paragraph 56 of the facts. And it is also worth noting from paragraph 59 that Ragnar did not terminate its unlawful occupation of the belt even after Aguilaville imposed these sanctions and even demanded Berlin to provide guarantee to its satisfaction before beginning discussions with Berlin concerning the return of the territory. These facts indicate that Ragnar was still in firm control of its policy, and Aguilaville's sanctions were not coercive. And in relation to our second argument, Your Excellencies, the respondent has tried to persuade its court in its written memorial that Aguilaville's trade embargo constituted a discrimination towards Ragnarian products and thus violated the most favored nation principle of WTO agreements, in particular, the GATT, Article 1.1. In response to this argument, it is our submission that Aguilaville's trade embargo could be justified under the Security Exception Clause of GATT, Article 21. Your Excellencies, WTO agreements allow a state to take any action which it considers necessary for the protection of its essential security interest. According to the panel report of the 2019 Russia Traffic in Transit case, the words it considers denote the self-judging nature of this clause, and it left states with a wide margin of discretion on whether an action was necessary or whether it constituted in essential security interest. However, Your Excellencies, to avoid abuse of this clause, as a matter of good faith, the state should at least give a minimally satisfactory explanation on why it takes such measures. Here, such minimally satisfactory requirement was met because Ragnar's illegal attack on Nand Gateway and Compound Arden have caused deaths of Aglavadian citizens and also caused tremendous loss to Aglaville's economy. The applicant deems it to be necessary to protect the personal safety of its nationals and its internal economy, which constituted an essential security interest. Another element of the security exception clause is that the measures must be taken in time of war or other emergency in international relations. Your Excellencies, other emergency in international relations, according to the panel report of the Russia Traffic in Transit case, refers to heightened tension and general instability surrounding a state. And here, Your Excellencies, since the situation in the Clarence Belt was acknowledged by Ragnar to be volatile and dangerous at paragraph 51 of the facts, and considering that Aglaville bordered on the Clarence Belt and Ragnar, we submit that Aglaville was surrounded by tension and instability. Satisfying the conditions laid down by the security exception clause, we submit that Aglaville's trade embargo was not a violation of WTO agreements. Concerning our third argument, Your Excellencies, the respondent may argue that Aglaville's trade embargo incurred shortage of medical supply in Ragnarian hospitals and thus interfered with the enjoyment of human rights of Ragnarian nationals, in particular, the right to health on the ICESCR Article 12. However, Your Excellencies, we respectfully urge this court to reject this argument. 
from paragraph 54 of the facts, we can see that this paragraph left blank the actual cause of the shortage of medical supply in Ragnarian hospitals. And therefore, we submit there was no sufficient evidence to prove the causal connections between Aglavel sanctions and Ragnarian shortage of medical supply. And that is supported by three pieces of facts. First, Aglavel did not specifically prohibit the export of medical goods to Ragnarian hospitals. Second, Aglavel was not a major exporter of medicine, as can be seen from paragraph one of the facts that Aglavel was a major manufacturer and exporter of computer hardware, with its technology industry the single most important contributor to its economy. Medical export only constituted a small portion of Aglavel's total export. And thirdly, Your Excellencies, the presence of other intervening factors as to the uncertainty of the causal nexus. Your Excellency, we are told at paragraph 54 of the facts. Your Excellency, do you have any questions? Um, and so I just want to be clear on the sanctions by Aglovel, uh, as you have argued that uh, they didn't do more harm than intended to Ragnell's interests. Um, and as you have rightly argued that these sanctions were taken during the time of the conflict or the time of the differences between Aglovel and Ragnell, I just wanted to find out, to be clear in my mind, whether um, the consequences of these uh, sanctions uh, were well thought through by Aglovel before implementing them. And the response by Ragnell where they raised uh, uh, the adverse effects which the sanctions were having on uh, Ragnell interests. How did uh, the state of uh, Aglovel handle that? Is it accepted under international law? Similar to the question that uh, Judge Mumba has asked, and, and you can answer both questions together, uh, it seems to me that uh, the case for the applicant is that in applying these sanctions, um, you were applying countermeasures? Your Excellencies, it is not our primary submission that Aglaville was implementing countermeasures. But it is it, not. Yes, Your Excellency, but if this court determined that Aglaville's uh, uh, Aglavel's economic sanctions were violations of international law, which means that it was a countermeasure in response to Ragnar's initial wrongful act. And Your Excellencies, concerning Your Excellencies' question, can I, uh, uh, if I uh, understand Your Excellencies correctly, are Your Excellencies referred to whether economic sanctions imposed by Aglavel were proportionate to Ragnar's initial wrongful act? Yes, that's the essence of my question. Mm -hmm. And also, to look, when you look at the a response by Ragnell, the, the, the issues they raised, that the adverse effects on their own interests. So you look at that aspect as well. Yes, Your Excellencies. We submit that Aglavel's economic sanctions were proportionate to Ragnell's initial wrongful act. And the tribunal in the 1978 Air Service Agreement case held that only measures that are clearly disproportionate would deny the legality of a valid countermeasure. And this entails a comparison between the effect of Aglavel's sanctions and Ragnar's initial wrongful act. And we can see from the facts, from paragraph 40 and 48 of the facts that Ragnar's attack on Nand Gateway and Compound Arden have caused eight deaths of Aglavelian citizens and also rendered dozens of Aglavelian citizens isolated and vulnerable because the only humanitarian corridor was destroyed. And besides your excellencies, from paragraph, uh, for Article 15 of the Peace Treaty, we can see that the Eman Thruway was vital to Aglavel's economy. And Ragnar's arbitrary bombing on the Nand Gateway severely caused tremendous loss to Aglavel's economy. And therefore, Excellencies, we submit that economic sanctions imposed by Aglavel was proportionate to the Ragnar's initial wrongful act. And with that, Your Excellencies, I will now turn to address the fourth issue. On early December 2021, Ragnall and Aglavel entered into a friendly negotiation in the management 
of the plastic waste. But right now, sudden bombing on Agloville's critical tunnel, the NAND gateway, cut into the cooperation. And under these circumstances, Agloville decided to suspend the negotiation until Ragnar ceased its continuing breach of the treaty. But Ragnar was reluctant to stop and instead transport the waste to Etna, a developing country with no capability to handle those waste. Now this issue comprises two parts, the legality of Ragnar's waste export and Agloville's suspension of the talk. And I will address them in turn. First, on Ragnar's waste export, we submit that Ragnar violated the peace treaty, Article 28. From its plain text, we can see that Ragnar was obliged to use its best practical means to prevent environmental pollution and harm. This article indicates an obligation of due diligence. Now, as due diligence is a broad principle, we would like to refer this court to a more specific rule under this principle. That is the obligation to ensure environmentally sound management of hazardous waste, which is derived from the Basel Convention, Article 42E. That the state of export should not export the hazardous waste to another state if it has reason to believe that the waste would not be managed in an environmentally sound manner. Now, Your Excellencies, we recognize that Ragnar was not a party to the Basel Convention. However, Your Excellencies, it is our submission that Article 42E of the Basel Convention still bind Ragnar. That is because this rule constituted a rule on the customary international law. The customary law status of this rule is supported by two reasons. First, there are 190 states that have already been parties to the Basel Convention, including the biggest importers and exporters of the plastic waste. There are only six United Nations members that are not parties to the Basel Convention. And second, even if we look at the practices from non-parties, we can still find support from states such as the United States, Fiji, Niue, South Sudan, and East Timor that have committed to the environmentally self-management of hazardous waste. And therefore, we submit that this rule was a well-founded custom. Now, turning back to the case, from paragraph 44 to 46 of the facts, we can see that the export activity was conducted between January 24th to February 24th, and the ELSA reports were issued on February 22nd during the course of the export activity. The ELSA report suggested that Aetna's primary treatment sites were not equipped to handle the large shipments from Ragnar, and the plastic waste would be managed in environmentally harmful practices. The ELSA report's conclusion gave Ragnar sufficient reason to believe that Aetna was not going to dispose of the waste in an environmentally sound manner, as was acknowledged by Ragnar at paragraph 56 of the facts that they knew that their arrangements with Aetna was not ideal. However, Ragnar did not terminate its export activity and instead continue its shipments to Aetna, thus violating the Basel Convention, Article 42E. C can I just interject and ask um, if you could throw a little bit of light on the kind of uh, waste that you're talking about? Uh, yes, your, the, yes, Your Excellencies. For, uh, Yes. yes, Your Excellencies. Mm -hmm. We can see from paragraph 38 of the facts that these wastes are non-biodegradable and unsorted PE and PVC. Mm -hmm. And this plastic mixture was determined by the 2020 amendments to Basel Convention as hazardous waste. And therefore, Your Excellencies, we submit that these wastes fall into the scope of the Basel Convention. And therefore, Ragnar should terminate its export activity once it has reason to believe that Aetna was not going to dispose the waste in an environmentally sound manner. Would, would it make a difference um, that the respondent has been an objector to the Basel um, and Stockholm conventions? Would that have any impact on the obligations? Yes, Your Excellency. say they've breached? Yes, Your Excellencies. We do know that the persistent objector May, not, may fall outside of the scope of the application of customary international law. 
But here in this case, Your Excellencies, we submit that Ragnar did not breach and did not object it to the Basel Convention because after, uh, after Ballin entered into Basel Convention, both Ragnar and Agleville committed to enact domestic legislation to protect the environment and also to ensure the factories in the Clarence Belt to commit to environmentally sound man management of hazardous waste. And therefore, Your Excellencies, we submit that Ragnar was not a persistent objector to this customary international mm -hmm. rule. And concerning our second part, Your Excellency, the respondent has claimed that Agleville's suspension of the talk runs foul of the duty to cooperate in good faith during negotiations. That we do acknowledge the existence of this rule, there was no evidence that Agleville acted in bad faith. If I may refer, Your Excellencies, to the 1931 railway traffic decision decided by this court's predecessor, the duty to negotiate in good faith your Excellency, do you have any question? Yes, just a question. Uh, is it your view that uh, uh, it is enough that uh, an international treaty has been ratified by a majority of states to conclude that the rules in that treaty are all reflecting customary international law? Certainly not, Your Excellencies, and two responses for that. First, we can see from North Sea Continental Shelf decision that a very widespread and representative participation in the multilateral treaty itself with a strong indication of customary international law, as long as it included states whose interests were specially affected. And here we submit that this was the case. And second, Your Excellencies, even if we look at the practices from non-states parties, we submit that states such as the United States, Fiji, Niue, and South Sudan has also committed to environmentally self-management of hazardous waste. And therefore, Your Excellency, it is our submission that at least Article 42E of the Basel Convention constituted customary international law. And Your Excellencies, the duty to negotiate in good faith required parties to negotiate with a view to concluding agreements. So it does not, set, and so it does not mean that parties must reach an agreement and does not mean that Agleville refused to, refusal to resume the talks was an indication of bad faith. In fact, prior to the first round of negotiations, Agleville responded quickly to Ragnar's request. The primary stimulus of Agleville's suspension of the talk, however, was Ragnar's bombing on the NAND gateway. And therefore, it was not Agleville's intention to frustrate the reach of a waste transfer agreement especially when Agleville agreed to resume the talks as soon as Ragnar terminated its military operation. And this concludes the applicant submissions. Unless your excellencies have further questions. Thank you, thank you very much. May it please thank the court. Thank you very much. Uh, I am now going to call upon uh, the agents of the agent of um, Ragnar to address the court. Thank you. Madam President, Your Excellencies, my name is Hannah Zigelski, and I'm the agent for the respondent, the state of Ragnar. My co-agent is Ali Askali Husseini, and Clara Perry will be acting as off counsel. I will be presenting the first two submissions before this court today. Namely, firstly, the lawfulness of Operation Shining Star, as well as the attack on Compound Arden. And secondly, the humane treatment of the detainees in the belt. My co-agent will be addressing the remaining two submissions regarding the unlawfulness of Agleville's unilateral coercive measures and the waste disposal in the belt. I will be speaking for 22 minutes. My co-agent will be speaking for 21 minutes and we reserve two minutes for Sir Rebuttal. To counter the applicant's characterization of Operation Shining Star, the respondent invites this court to consider the dire situation that it found itself in at the time it launched that operation. Within two years, 
it had witnessed and endured 233 violent attacks on its people, businesses, and police forces, resulting in 40 deaths. To put that into perspective, that equals an attack roughly every three days. And even after one destructive attack on three Wagnerian factories, resulting in 50 deaths, the respondent was left to fend for itself. The respondent therefore invites this court to consider the following submissions in light of these events. First, that this court should refrain from adjudicating the applicant's claim regarding Operation Shining Star, as it is inadmissible as Balan is an indispensable third party to these proceedings. Under the monetary gold principle established by this court on page 32 of the monetary gold removed from Rome judgment, a claim is inadmissible where the rights or obligations of a third party form the very subject matter of the case at hand. In this case, the lawful exercise of self-defense of the respondent depends firstly on Balan's unwillingness and inability to prevent the UAC from carrying out attacks in the belt, and secondly, should the court hold that the respondent was lawfully exercising its right to self-defense, it would in turn imply an obligation on Balan to tolerate the military on its territory. The respondent therefore submits that absent Balan's intervention in this matter, the court should refrain from adjudicating on this issue. Alternatively, should the court find that this claim is in fact admissible, the respondent submits that it was acting in lawful self-defense when it launched Operation Shining Star. The applicant has objected to that exercise of self-defense by the respondent on two grounds. Firstly, on the basis of this court's previous jurisdiction in the armed activities case as well as the wall advisory opinion, and secondly, on the basis of the statement that a right to self-defense against non-state actors has not yet reached customary status. The respondent will address both of these objections. Firstly, it is the respondent's submission that the right to self-defense is triggered by the act of an armed attack and not the actor in question. This, for example, is reflected in the wording of Article 51 of the UN Charter, which does not restrict the right to self-defense to attacks by states. Your Excellency, do you have a question? <coughs> Furthermore, it is the respondent's submission that these, this right to self-defense, as codified in Article 51 UN Charter, must be interpreted in light of the development of customary international law. The respondent, uh, the applicant, has stated that armed activities and the war advisory opinion have limited the right to self-defense to the armed attacks by states. The respondent would like to consider the facts that the most recent armed activities opinion, uh, excuse me, judgment in that case, concerned a conflict taking place from 1998 to 1999. In accordance with the doctrine of intertemporal law found in the island of Palmer's arbitration on page 845, the court could thus only take into account state practice and opinion years taking place at the time. It could thus not take into account the subsequent Security Council resolutions 1368 and 1373, acknowledging the right to self-defense in the context of attacks by terrorists and non-state actors. Furthermore, more recent developments, for example, the intervention in Syria, also show that states have consistently exercised their right to self-defense against non-state actors, as, for example, evidenced by Security Council Resolution 2249. It is therefore submitted by the respondent that state practice, in fact, in exists by these invoking states, that a right to self-defense is permissible to be exercised against non-state actors. Furthermore, this has also been supported by ample scholarship, for example, in the ILA report from 2018 on the use of force, which has held that such a right to self-defense can be found in state practice, in fact. Regarding the applicants pointing towards objecting states, the respondent invokes the doctrine of the persistent objector as found in Norwegian fisheries jurisdiction in that case, 
which, which establishes that if a custom is developing, states persistently objecting to that custom are not bound by it. However, in the present circumstances, the applicant, or rather Balan in this case, has not objected to the doctrine. It is therefore held that it is, in fact, applicable in these proceedings. Furthermore, that self-defense exercised by the respondent was also necessary and proportionate. The respondent only exercised its right to self-defense after it had repeatedly asked Balan to take effective measures against the UAC attacks, which can be found in paragraph 26 of the Statement of Agreed Facts. Balan, however, did not everything that it could have done. Firstly, it only instated border controls on commercial vehicles, thus leaving private vehicles unchecked. Given that the UAC is a private organization, this is insufficient to prevent the transfer of arms and people into the belt. Furthermore, as found in paragraph 59 of the Statement of Agreed Facts, the uh, Balan did not criminalize the membership in the UAC, thus making it easier for them to acquire further members and recruit people for the attacks against the respondent. It is therefore submitted that the respondent had no other choice than to launch the attack against the UAC in order to defend its people and businesses from further harm. I will now turn to my second argument on this issue, before, namely... Before you wanted to ask a question as well? Mm -hmm. um, you ask first, I'll ask a okay. question. Yeah. On, the, uh, on your submission about um, Ragnar's uh, right to um, attack, um, the institutions in the belt because of uh, the UAC uh, activities. Uh, the facts show that uh, Balan uh, did take every possible action to stop the UAC. But because the UAC was like um, um, an a, a group of people who did not follow any international law at all, and they, they didn't respect their own uh, country's uh, law, so they were able to act the way they did. So it does show that Balan did take um, a sufficient steps to try and uh, stop these activities, but uh, though they failed. And uh, is it your submission that uh, from the point of view of Ragnel, uh, Balan didn't take what Ragnel considered to be uh, important steps to stop the activities of the UAC. Yes, Your Excellency, that is in fact the respondent's submission. The respondent holds that, for example, in accordance with UN Security Council Resolution 1373, which was held under Chapter 7 and therefore binding under Article 25 of the UN Charter, Balan had in fact an obligation to instate effective border controls to prevent attacks on another state's territory and furthermore, to prevent the acquisition of further membership by the UAC. And it is the respondent's position on this matter that these steps were a legal obligation on Balan, which it did not undertake. And furthermore, additionally, even if the court found that Balan had been willing to do all of this, it was still unable to establish effective control over the UAC actions as can be found in paragraph 35 of the Statement of Agreed Facts, Your Excellencies. And it is therefore the respondent's submission that it had no other choice than to intervene itself in this matter. So my question is related um, to the attack uh, on the Nant uh, Gateway. Um, this gateway is, according to the facts, the only means of transferring humanitarian goods into the occupied belt, and it's used for transferring civilians out of the belt, etc. So the, the, the question really relates to uh, why the respondent, yourselves, considered um, that this was a military, you know, that it was a, a lawful military objective uh, since its nature, location, and purpose and use, according to the applicants, were civilian. 
Madam President, in fact, it is the respondent's submission on this that while the Nant Gateway was being used by civilians and for the purpose of transporting goods, it was also by being used by the UAC to transport personnel and weapons into the belt, as can be found in paragraph 41 of the Statement of Agreed Facts. It therefore becomes a dual-use object. A dual-use object does not breach, the, an attack on a dual-use object does not prima facie breach the principle of a distinction under international humanitarian law, which prohibits attacks on civilian objectives, but rather must be factored into the proportionality analysis of the attack under international humanitarian law. The respondent hereby refers the court to the privilege decision by the ICTY trial chamber with very similar facts. In that case, an old bridge of Mostar was bombed by the military in order to prevent military from accessing the city in which, this, uh, in which the attacks were taking place. In the appeals chamber of that case, the appeals chamber overturned the trial chamber's holding that this attack had been disproportionate as they regarded that bridge as a lawful military objective. And to answer your, Madam President's question regarding the difficulty of transporting humanitarian goods into the belt, that is a unilateral statement made in paragraph 42 of the Statement of Agreed Facts by a minister for Aglovale. And this court has held in its Nicaragua decision, in paragraph 70 specifically, that statements partial to one side of the parties before the court must be treated with great caution. And the respondent furthermore re refers, Madam President, to paragraph 7, 31 and 49 of the Statement of Agreed Facts, which in fact show that Rignell had a common border with the belt, which was still accessible. And furthermore, the belt was accessible via a seaport. Therefore, in fact, it can be inferred that humanitarian goods could still be transported across the border. If that has satisfied Your Excellency's question, I would like to move on. Please, please move on. To the respondent's submission on compound Arden and quickly address the objections raised regarding the drone footage. Mm -hmm. The applicant has stated that the respondent violated the principle of precaution in this matter. The principle of precaution states that everything feasible must be done to verify that there is no unnecessary civilian harm in an attack on a military objective. What is reasonable must be determined on a case-by-case -case basis, as was found in the prosecutor's report on the NATO bombings in Yugoslavia. And it must be determined by the standard of a reasonable commander. A reasonable commander is, as was elaborated in the Galic judgment by the ICTY, specifically paragraph 58, a commander who relies on reasonable accessible information and draws reasonable inferences on, these information, uh, on that information. In these circumstances, the respondent submits that Ragnar relied on multiple sources of information. First, on drone footage collected um, merely a few days ago, namely as stated in the paragraphs, a statement of agreed facts in paragraph 47, it was collected the preceding month, given that the attack took place on the 7th of March, that could have been no more than a week ago. Furthermore, that drone footage was corroborated by photographic evidence provided by the Balani witness and by maps and that witness's testimony. It is therefore reasonable that a commander would have decided on the basis of this information that there were no civilians in the compound. Also, the respondent submits that the submission of a background check in this regard was not necessary as there was ex ante no reasonable doubt about the credibility of the witness. In the interest of time, the respondent will now move on to the second submission, namely regarding the treatment of the detainees in the belt. The respondent will first establish that, in fact, the laws governing non-international armed conflicts apply in this situation, and secondly, that these rules were complied with by the respondent when it required the detainees to work with the waste and when it transferred them to Camlin Correctional Center. The applicant has based their argument on the applicability of the laws of international armed conflict and specifically Geneva Convention 3 on the declaration made by the UAC in clarification seven of the statement of agreed facts. This declaration was made under 
Article 96, Paragraph 3 of the Additional Protocol 1. This declaration must, however, comply with the requirements laid out in Article 1, Paragraph 4 of the Additional Protocol 1, which requires that there is a national liberation movement fighting against alien occupation in exercise of their right to self-determination. And the respondent submits that in these specific circumstances, these requirements have not been fulfilled. Firstly, the concept of alien occupation is not the same as can be found in Article 42 of the Hague Regulations, but rather requires that there is an occupation of a territory by a state while a territory was in the process of becoming a state. And the statement of agreed facts in paragraph five, in fact, states that the belt is universally recognized as part of the territory of Balan. It was therefore not in the process of becoming a state. Therefore, the first requirement of alien occupation in this circumstance is not met. Secondly, even if the court held that the requirement of occupation was met, the, uh, the UAC would still not be fighting in a fight for self-determination. Self-determination is defined in the Friendly De Relations Declaration by the UN General Assembly as the right to freely determine without interference in their political status and to pursue their economic, social and, de uh, excuse me, social and other development. And as can be found in Article 11D of the treaty, the respondent in fact did not interfere with any of these rights as it was only entitled to exercise its authority in the belt under the lease on its own citizens. It was only allowed to apply its own laws to its citizens and nothing in the statement of agreed facts indicates that in fact exercised its legal authority over any other citizens in the belt. And the respondent further submits that the notification provided by the depository in the absence of the fulfillment of these requirements does not have the legally binding effect of Article 96, Paragraph 3, as depositories, as regulated in Article 77 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, merely perform formal functions, such as ascertaining that the formal requirements of declarations and treaties have been met, and that they are not legally obliged, in that sense, to ascertain the actual existence of material requirements. The respondent therefore holds that the laws governing non-international armed conflicts apply in this case. This means that the detainees only needed to be treated humanely. Humane treatment is defined as respecting the physical and mental health and the dignity of the human being in the particular circumstances. This required that, firstly, the detainees must be compensated for their work. Secondly, they may not be treated differently from the local population. And thirdly, that when working, they are provided with sufficient safeguards. Your Excellencies, regarding the first two points in this, the respondent refers to the Statement of Agreed Facts, paragraph 44, and clarifications 5, which shows that the detainees were paid and in fact worked alongside 150 Regnellian workers and were treated equally to them. The only point the applicant can thus make is that the nature of the work was dangerous and that the safety gear provided was not sufficient to safeguard the detainees from harm. On this, Your Excellencies, the respondent refers this court to information provided by the Public Health Agency of Canada, the NHS and the CDC on their website regarding the CD and MRSA bacteria found in the waste. That web, these websites firstly state that the bacteria are contracted via physical contact. Thus, masks and gloves would be sufficient to prevent that bacteria get into wounds of detainees or are contracted via contact, for example, to, through the mouth. And furthermore, the respondent submits that even if that safety gear had not been sufficient to prevent the spread of the bacteria, the same websites just cited also state that these bacteria are not dangerous to healthy people. 
and as can be found in clarifications five of the statement of facts. In fact, the Ragnell only required healthy detainees to work with the waste. Furthermore, the applicant has alleged that the transferal to Kamlan Correctional Center was contrary to international humanitarian law. However, the respondent submits that it in fact actively complied with international humanitarian law when it transferred the detainees outside of an active combat zone, as can be found in paragraph 49 of the Statement of Agreed Facts, the fighting was drawing closer, and given that the belt is a small territory, as can be found in clarifications too, not bigger than the Faroe Islands, it could not transfer them anywhere else, and thus it was the best option to remove them from the belt altogether. This was also in the detainees' interests. And with that, I conclude my submission on this matter and defer to my co-agent to present the remaining two issues. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam President, Your Excellencies. It is an honor to plead before this court today. My name is Alia Skali Husseini, and in my 21 minutes before this court, I will address the final two issues. First, I will address the third issue concerning the unlawfulness of Aglavale's unilateral coercive sanctions against Ragnell. And finally, regarding the lawfulness of Ragnell's management of plastic waste. Your Excellencies, Aglavale's sanctions against Ragnell are the antithesis of a peaceful means of dispute settlement. The applicant speaks of, quote, detergent rather than the more blatant reality of coercion. Ragnell perceives no peace in the deprivation of its citizens' human rights and the destruction of its economy. As such, in our third submission, respondent submits that Aglavale's unilateral coercive measures are in violation of international law. Aglavale sanctions violate, first, the non-intervention principle, second, Article 2, Paragraph 3 of the treaty, third, the right, to, the right to highest attainable health, fourth, the customary laws on state immunity, and finally, Aglavale's obligations under the WTO. Additionally, Aglavale sanctions cannot be justified as lawful countermeasures. To respond to the applicant's submission, we will first proceed with our arguments on the non-intervention principle. The non-intervention principle is a cornerstone in international law. It holds that states may not employ coercive means in order to infringe upon another state's sovereign rights. Accordingly, two elements are present when a state violates this principle. First, coercion and secondly, interference with the state's sovereignty. Aglavale's unilateral coercive sanctions include both of these elements. Contrary to the applicant's submission in that Nicaragua contended and disregarded economic coercion as being able to violate the non-intervention principle, the respondent submits that since 1986, immense opinion juris and state practice has evolved in order to help the court ascertain the contents of this customary international law as it currently stands today. For this, we refer the court to the biannually adopted UNG resolutions 76-191, 77-7, and 77-214, all reiterating the same principle that no state may use economic measures to coerce another state's into the subordination of the exercise of its sovereign rights. The threshold for such coercion can be exemplified by the US sanctions against Cuba and Iran, as was reported on by the UN Human Rights Council 4246 in 2019 on the impact of unilateral coercive measures. The cases share two commonalities. First, the sanctions caused grave economic decline to both countries. And secondly, the sanctions were so severe that access to vital medical necessities deteriorated. Aglaville sanctions meets this threshold for economic coercion. Not only has Ragnell's economic decline surpassed that, that of Iran at the height of the sanctions imposed against it, 
but similarly to both cases, access to medical necessities entirely halted to the state of Ragnall. Aglaville sanctions thus constitute economic coercion, leading us to the second element, notably interference with another state's sovereign right. Aglaville, the respondent submits, has interfered and imposed these sanctions targeted against Ragnall's sovereign right to self-defense, and as such, by hindering Ragnall's ability to protect its people and its businesses, Aglaville has violated the non-intervention principle. Your Excellencies, if there are no questions, we will now proceed to the applicant's claims on the human rights violations of Aglaville. First, to respond to the applicant's assertion that there is no causal nexus between Aglaville's sanctions and the harm caused to Ragnallian's rights. We refer the court to the Tehran hostages cases in which this court asserted that when there are concurrent causes that cause an indivisible injury to a state, that this does not reduce nor attenuate the reparations owed to that state. It is sufficient that it is foreseeable that such sanctions would harm the access of Ragnell to medical necessities, as the sanctions to remind this court were also implemented against the transportation sector in Ragnell, pursuant to paragraph 53 of the Statement of Agreed Facts. Your Excellencies, Aglaville is bound by Article 12 of the ICESCR to ensure Ragnallian's right to highest attainable standard of health. This right does entail an extraterritorial application as interpreted by the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which stated that state parties should refrain at all times from imposing embargoes or any similar measures restricting the supply of another state with adequate medicines and medical equipment. Your Excellencies, in the present case, Aglaville imposed sanctions which contributed to Ragnall's inability to access medical equipment and thus violated Ragnallian's right to adequate health care under Article 12 ICESCR. May I ask you one question? Uh, I understand what you are saying now about uh, the violation of human rights law, but one thing is not clear in my mind. What is the relationship between that alleged violation of uh, human rights law and violation of the principle of non-intervention? Because you have also spoken about the human rights consequences of the sanctions uh, a few minutes before. So, is there any, any relation, and if so, what is the relationship between the two aspects? Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. The respondent, in fact, submits that the non-intervention principle and the human rights claims invoked by the respondent are two separate arguments. However, the respondent referred to the deprivation of the supply of medicines and medical equipment to exemplify to this court the coercive element necessary for a breach of the non-intervention principle. <coughs> and thus, the economic coercion was so severe, similarly as to the Iran and Cuba case, that Ragnell failed to attain those medical necessities. The human rights claims, however, are based on Article 12, ICESCR. Now, Your Excellencies, we will proceed to respond to the applicant on the claims of violations of WTO law. By being a party to the GATT and GATS, Aglaville is under the obligation to respect the most favored nation principle, the prohibition on quantitative restrictions, and the commitment to market access. Respectively, these provisions forbid discriminatory treatment between members and the restriction of supplying of services and of products. Aglaville's economic sanctions, Your Excellencies, suspended all trade with Ragnell, discriminating against this trade and its services, and violating all three WTO law provisions. The applicant seeks to justify these sanctions and its violations of WTO law under the national security exception within the GATT. 
Contrary to the applicant's submission, however, Aglovale cannot be justified under the WTO national security exception. To remind this court, the security exception is not self-judging and is subject to objective criteria, most relevantly of, of which is the necessity for a plausible link between the measure adopted and the author state's alleged essential security interest. This understanding of it not being self-judging is found in the same panel report that the applicant uh, invokes, notably Russia traffic in transit at paragraph 7.102. Your Excellencies, the applicant alleges that its essential security interests are threatened by the ongoing armed conflict in the belt. Considering this claim, it is implausible to connect the destruction of Ragnell's economy to the protection of its essential security. It is respondent's submission that this is a two-sided conflict. Harming only one side will not prevent its continuation. Finally, Your Excellencies, we will respond to the applicant's claims that it can be justified under the customary international laws on countermeasures. First, Your Excellencies, lawful countermeasures must respond to an internationally wrongful act. As outlined by my co-agent in our first submission, this has not been committed by the state of Ragnell. Alternatively, legal countermeasures must directly target those responsible for the alleged wrongdoing. Aglovale sanctions bear no regard for this requirement, targeting innocent Ragnellians and Ragnellian companies. Lastly, countermeasures must always adhere to proportionality and must neither infringe on human rights nor state immunity. Aglovale sanctions lacked proportionality in that they are irreversible for the Ragnellians forced out of employment, forced to shut down their businesses, and deprived of their property and adequate health care. As delineated in pages 22 and 21 of our memorial, they breached the laws on state immunity and are most concerningly for the state of Ragnell, they continue to breach its people's human rights. As such, Your Excellencies, Aglovale sanctions are unlawful under the treaty and international law, and Aglovale must therefore provide restitution and compensation for the state of Ragnell. I will now move to the fourth and final submission before this court. Regarding this last issue, Your Excellencies, the respondent submits that Aglovale violated its duty to cooperate under Article 28 of the treaty. And secondly, that Ragnell complied with its obligations by exporting its waste to Etna. Your Excellencies, we will first respond to the applicant's allegations of a breach and a violation of the ESM principle. First, it is respondent's submission that the Basel Convention is inapplicable as neither Ragnell nor Aglovale are parties to the convention, as is evidenced by paragraph 19 of the Statement of Agreed Facts. And further, Your Excellencies, it does not reflect customary international law. To constitute customary international law, provisions must be of a fundamentally norm-creating <coughs> character, as was found in paragraph 72 of the North Sea Continental Shelf Judgment. And as such, Your Excellencies, the Basel Convention is lex specialis to general environmental law, in that it is, it is focused merely on the transport of hazardous waste rather than having a general character within its provisions. Further, Your Excellencies, any evidence of state practice or opinion juris of state par parties cannot provide evidence of customary international law as they are merely acting in conformity with this convention, as was also find, found in the North Sea Continental Shelf at paragraph 76. Alternatively, Your Excellencies, even if this court were to find that the ESM principle is customary, it is respondent's submission that Ragnell complied with its obligations. Your Excellencies, according to the same provision which the applicant invokes, notably Article 4 of the Basel Convention, export is allowed if it cannot be efficiently disposed of in the exporting state's territory, an environmentally sound management of waste can reasonably be expected in the importing state. When no notorious lack of suitable facilities exists in the importing state, this allows 
the exporting state to send its hazardous waste for environmentally sound management in the importing state. And as such, Your Excellencies, Ragnell complied with this obligation. The only practicable and feasible way that it could ensure the protection of the environment within the, the uh, peninsula was to transport its waste to Etna. As previously mentioned, Etna was a party to the Basel and Stockholm Convention and entered into an agreement under Article 11 of the Basel Convention, ensuring Ragnell that it would dispose of the waste in an environmentally sound manner. Your Excellencies, there was no... In Judge Abraham has a question. Uh, excuse me, just a, a legal, legal point. Uh, according to Article 28 of the treaty, uh, second sentence, parties shall use their best practicable means to prevent or to remedy environmental pollution and harm inter alia by compliance with all relevant rules of international law. Inter alia, what does it mean? What, what, what is the effect, if any, of those two words in the context of Article 28, in your view? It is respondent's submission that according to Article 28 of the treaty, that that the respondent and Ragnell had the obligation to ensure the and prevent or remedy environmental pollution and harm in accordance with the relevant international law, which it itself is also bound by. Yes, it means that it means that the words inter alia have no meaning. Uh, no, Your Excellency. In fact, it is respondent's submission that this must be in accordance with the relevant international law. And as such, it is respondent's submission that this relevant international law is that of the prevention principle, which is customary, Your Excellencies, according to paragraph 101 of the Pulp Mills judgment. With this in mind, Your Excellencies, Ra the respondents will delineate to this court how Ragnell, in fact, complied with the prevention principle. The prevention principle in environmental law obliges states to use all means at their disposal in order to avoid activities within its territory from causing transboundary harm. The pre prevention principle is an obligation of conduct, not an obligation of result. This was found by this court as most recently as 2022 in the dispute over the status and use of the waters of the Silo. And as such, Your Excellencies, we reiterate that Ragnell had no means at its disposal to prevent the unprecedented risk of environmental harm triggered by the accumulating waste in the belt. Thus, the only means available to it, considering Agloville's refusal to cooperate, were those in Etna, and it reasonably expected it to manage the waste in an environmentally sound manner. Now, Your Excellencies, to respond to the applicants... Uh, be before you proceed, um... Is, is it the case of the respondent um, that the plastics, uh, the plastic waste, uh, or the disposal of plastic waste and the management of the disposal of plastic waste, uh, plastic waste being a fairly recent material, uh, really forms part of customer international law? Is that your, your, your um, contention? No, Your Excellency. In fact, it is our primary submission in regards to the effects of the plastic waste being hazardous under the environmental sound management of waste principle, that this principle is in fact not customary. However, alternatively, the respondent maintains the submission that it complied with any international obligations which are relevant in the, plastic, uh, in, in the present case in the management of said plastic waste. Your Excellency, we will now conclude by presenting the manner in which Aglaville violated its duty to cooperate under Article 28 of the treaty. Your Excellencies, Aglaville is legally bound by Article 28 to cooperate in good faith in the management and reducing the risk of significant harm to the environment in the peninsula. This duty to cooperate reflects the customary international law duty to cooperate which entails that parties must consult one another on preventive measures 
by seeking equitable solutions based on their respective interests while genuinely aiming at environmental conservation. By halting negotiations prematurely, Aglovale showed no regard for the environmental interests of the entirety of the region, nor Ragnell, and thus failed to uphold its duty to cooperate and to balance its interests with those of Ragnell. Thus, Your Excellencies, it is, it is respondent's submission that Aglovale violated this duty to cooperate by halting its negotiations before they came to a consideration as to what the right uh, measures were to take in order to dispose of the waste. Your Excellencies, with this, we request this honorable court to adjudge and declare the prayers for relief, which are listed on page 36 of our memorial. And if there are no further questions, this concludes our submissions. Thank you. Thank you. I thank counsel um, for the respondent. Which brings us to the second round, the rebuttals. Um, and you have a couple of minutes for your rebuttals uh, from the applicant. Madam President and Your Excellencies, two points in rebuttal. The first point regarding pleading for. The respondent has claimed that prior to the export, Ragnar has sufficient reason to believe that Aetna was going to dispose of the waste in an environmentally sound manner because Aetna committed to do so. However, Your Excellencies, what we are arguing here is that after the ELSA report were issued during the course of the export activity, Ragnar did not terminate its unlawful export activity. And we stress the probative value of the ELSA reports here to this court because this court in practice accorded great importance to neutral and professional international organizations' reports. For instance, in a Croatia genocide case, this court emphasized the importance of a report prepared by the United Nations Commission on Human Rights because of the independent status of its author and the fact that the report was prepared for the function of, for the exercise of its functions. And the second point regarding pleading one, the respondent argued that state practice supports self-defense against non-state actors. However, the International Law Commission, in its draft conclusions on the identification of customary international law, stated that to assess if state practices are sufficient or not, the nature of the rule should be taken into account. The right of self-defense serves as an exception to the general prohibition on the use of force and is directly connected with international peace and security. Thus, the state practice must be uniform to establish a new customary international law. And in light of the contradicted, contradicting state practices, we submit that the state cannot take action against non-state actors. May it please the court. <laughs> Madam President, Your Excellencies, the respondent will now address the two rebuttals made by the applicant. First, regarding the ILSA report, triggering a duty on the, uh, on the respondent to not export the plastic waste. Regarding the evidentiary value of the ILSA report, the respondent submits that this court stated that it should treat with great caution the evidence emanating from a single source, which was found in the Nicaragua statement, and furthermore, the respondent supports this by pointing to the armed activities case, where the court found that a sketch ma map based on a map of approximate deployment of forces in the DRC was insufficient to corroborate claims in this matter. It is therefore submitted that a single source report by ILSA, which was not in fact verified and in fact disputed by Aetna in these proceedings, is not sufficient to trigger the duty of the respondent to be more cautious in the disposal of the waste. Secondly, regarding the threshold established by the applicant in their rebuttal regarding the formation of custom, the applicant submitted that there must be almost universal 
a uniform practice. However, this court has also stated in paragraph 186 of the Nicaragua judgment, it is sufficient that a certain practice is generally complied with. And furthermore, the respondent stresses that the situation that the respondent found itself is, is very rare, namely being attacked by non-state actors on a territory that is not its own. It is therefore an exceptional circumstance and can only be addressed by very few states in their state practice. It is thus submitted that the practice of specially affected states, as found in North Sea Continental Shelf, is in fact sufficient to establish the threshold of state practice in these regards. Thank you very much. With this, I conclude the Sir rebuttal. I would like to thank the parties um, for their oral submissions. And uh, as the court has no other business, uh, we will retire to deliberate. And I hope that the agents will remain available um, for any questions or notices that the court may wish uh, to consult them about. And we will deliver our judgment uh, shortly. The Honorable Thank Court you. is now adjourned. Please join me in congratulating these two teams for a marvelous world championship round. Standing oh, my. All right, while the, while the judges are deliberating and they've told us that it's, it is going to take a while, we customarily recognize a number of people who've made this possible. I'd like to start by, of course, thanking these two teams. They have uh, entertained us for an afternoon um, they will continue to entertain in about 10 minutes, I hope, when our audiovisual company posts the round live uh, to the internet with audio. So for those of you who have parents and whatnot watching, we are assured by, uh, by Encore that uh, this will be uh, eventually on the internet with audio. I'd like to thank all of our judges you have put in, many of you, as much time as the competitors. Well, not, not you, Andrew. You have put them through their paces, and the quality of what we just saw and the quality improvements that we saw in teams around the world, from match to match, from round to round, um, is due in no small part uh, to how hard you made it for them. So thank you so much. I'd like to thank our national administrators around the world who um, did a marvelous job this year selecting teams that are in this room, setting up situations uh, just like this on a smaller scale uh, in, in more than 60 countries. Our national administrators are the backbone of our volunteer army around the world. So much so that several years ago, ILSA created a, an award named after our founding chairman, Stephen Schneebaum, to recognize the most important uh, contribute, contributing national administrators in the world. And I'd like to ask a, uh, since neither of them are here, I'd like to ask a representative 
uh, from one of the German teams that are here to come and pick up a plaque for the German national administrator, Vincent Fiddy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, year in and year out, as, as many of you know, um, especially after my, my age was announced at last night's party, um, <laughs> I've been working with Ilsa for a long time. Um, and one of the things that I see over the years is that certain patterns repeat themselves in certain countries. Um, uh, a country gets good and then sinks back into the waves and then they come back again and, and you know, we, uh, we see huge participation in one country, and then it, it dwindles for a little while, and huge participation in the United States, and then it dwindles for a while. Um, one of the things that I have noticed is that in the in Jessup, Turkey, uh, it, Jessup is taken very, very serious in Turkey, very, very seriously in Turkey, and every so often, tempers boil over, and I get 100 complaints. Um, this team against this team, this team against this team, a judge against a team, a team against a judge, a judge against another judge, um, and everybody against the national administrator, of course. Well, this year, Efi Soysal fixed all that, and we had an extremely successful Turkish national rounds, uh, concluded amicably with top quality judges and a, a significant number of teams and uh, uh, FA and, and, and team uh, recruited those teams, sort of set the ground rules, recruited judges, and, and really just made the Turkish rounds this year a model for the rest of the world. So if I could have a representative uh, from the Koch University team, please come up and take this back with you to Turkey. With my team. I'd like to thank our marvelous bailiffs. When I thanked the judges, I just sort of waved over at them and said, you know, there they are. Um, they get enough thanks over the course of the week. They get to wear fashionable black robes. They get to be called your excellency you know, patted on the head, they get deferred to no matter how dumb the question is. <laughs> but bailiffs work largely without thanks. Uh, uh, and so I would like to ask the following people to please stand and be applauded. Adele Duvall, Ana Clara Leal de Costa Bueno, Ana Vitoria Munez Bocos, Axel Pesmin, Aziza Donirova, Beatriz Elena Nunez Figuera Dantes, Catherine Perez, Serena So, Eli Luz, Emily Catherine Welby, Felipe Ribedinera Kowalski, Felipe Tomazzini, Fernando Acevedo, Galen Kostov, Batunda Ndeya Ketuba, Gilda Naguera Pias Cambria, Grace Brown, ha Habib Labe Camara, Heather Colby, James Aporecu, Jasmine Opperman, Karina Kubaki, Laura Dovalle, Larissa Rivello, Leon Haas, Lilene Tato, Maria Filipova, Maya Gerlach, Merix Alexanian, Mikhail Bidbuyan, Milena Kotrim, Nadine Hurth, Nayara Limarocha da Cruz, Reed Winos, Sabrina March, Thais Lionel Magayas, Vicky Cheng, Xinyan Zhao, and Yanisa Elias. I would like to thank two volunteers in particular this year. 
Uh, we had a lot of turnover in the last year, uh, a lot of new faces, um, and we brought this all back uh, to face-to-face. -to -face. Uh, most of us couldn't remember what it was like. There were pieces of this competition that we said, what did we do four years ago? We have no idea. Hasn't the competition always started on Saturday? <laughs> Hasn't the national dress ball always been on Friday? But two people in particular have really stepped up this week to make everything work. And so um, if, if he's in the room and not, not exhausted, I'd like to ask Derek Moore to please come up. <laughs> Hence the caveat. <laughs> and then the other person, the other glue, not others, the wrong word here, the glue that held us all together this week um, and, and played just about every role out there did not respect uh, typical chain of command, uh, much to my benefit, uh, ignored me when I needed to be ignored, uh, took the initiative and, and was really helpful. Thais Neves. I'd like to thank um, my, my longtime partner in crime, as I've referred to her. Usually we're sitting over here watching some other executive director uh, uh, do this. It's, it's my turn now. Um, she is not only the, um, the representative of our, our wonderful sponsor, White & Case, uh, but she helps me personally and the organization uh, that throughout the year in, in, in thousands of countless ways, and she is my dear friend, Elizabeth Black. And it goes without saying that uh, the three people that you have seen the most this week out in front of every problem, out in front of every opportunity, um, chasing you guys around when you're 15 minutes late to a match, uh, beating judges into submission, uh, really doing everything that is needed to make a gigantic machine of this size. Well, we'll do this one at a time. Um, First of all, on communications and everything else, uh, technological, including some pretty insurmountable stuff this year, could I ask uh, Chris Bonet to come up? I think he's working on the, uh, the feed, so. She's probably in the back. There she is. Well, I see one. Where's the other one? Yeah, we're pointing over there. Where are we pointing? Um, the the master of ceremonies for the whole thing, uh, the the person who planned all of this out, and mapped it out, liaised with the hotel, and has been doing things like that throughout the year. Uh, Shannon Hutchins. have a talk about attending the final round. <laughs> and of course, uh, uh, as I keep calling her the brains of the operation, uh, I've gotten into the habit of just saying, just ask Stephanie, Stephanie Corzantes. <laughs> Thank you.
I have one other person to thank, but, uh, but I'm going to introduce him instead. Um, for the past several years, including during the entire COVID era, uh, Mark Luz has served a chair, as chair of the ILSA Board of Directors. Uh, he was there when, when he and Leslie Ben made the shattering decision to shut down the international rounds in 2020. And he led the charge uh, in response to COVID uh, to go online and has steered the board ably through a number of challenges over his term. This will be his last international rounds as chair of the board of ILSA. Uh, I'd like to introduce my friend, Mark Luz. didn't realize I was going to come up and actually give a speech. I did, actually. I wrote something. I just didn't know I was going to do it right now. Um, good afternoon. As Michael said, uh, my name is Mark Laws, and I, I have had the honor and privilege of serving as the chair of the board of the International Law Students Association for the past three years. Some of you might know me from my webcast persona, where my head was surrounded by a computer screen at various times of the morning, afternoon, and evening um, over the past three years when the Jessup was forced to adopt a virtual presence during the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, the advantage for me in making recorded speeches and announcement for the Jessup was the ability to do multiple takes and recordings to make sure I didn't stumble over my words. And the advantage for the viewers when I was delivering a speech online was the ability to get up and leave to go get a snack or use the restroom. But we're finally back here in person together. And while many of you might actually want to be getting up to leave right now, I know you won't because the primary duty of the ILSA chair at today's proceedings is to announce the topic of next year's competition. I have it right here. The Jessup 2024 topic will be read out in a moment. <laughs> After three years of being online, please indulge me for just a few more minutes while I have this opportunity so I can express the immense gratitude the International Law Students Association has for everyone in this room and those watching online. I've had a huge smile on my face all week. How different it was than three years ago when Leslie Ben, Ilsa's former executive director, my predecessor, Bill Burke White, and the rest of us on the Ilsa board were forced to make that heartbreaking decision to cancel the 2020 Jessup competition because of the COVID-19 pandemic. I can tell you honestly, it was not just the students and their coaches who were in tears when that decision was announced. ILSA did its very best to quickly organize a virtual ceremony to present awards and to reassure all of those students that all of the effort that they had put into the Jessup that year was not in vain, even though so many national rounds were hastily canceled and we were not able to gather here in Washington, D.C. We were kept apart for another two years. But with the incredible leadership, Leslie Ben, Tessa Walker, Michael Pyle, and so many other volunteers, many of whom who are here today, we were able to create a virtual experience which recreated the Jessup in not the same, but in other unique ways. In 2021, we were able to open up the White and Case Global Rounds to almost 600 teams in rounds that ran at all hours of the day and for several weeks in a row. In 2022, the Jessup went back to a more traditional and quite frankly manageable format, but still accomplished the goal of having students grapple with the most pressing challenges of international law and to present their arguments from around the, in front of judges from around the world. We couldn't be there together in person, 
but the spirit of the Jessup was never extinguished. And we know that the difficult years of the pandemic did nothing to dampen the enthusiasm for this competition by looking around here today. So many students that participated in the virtual Jessup are here now as competitors again, as coaches, as judges, and as bailiffs. And so many of the online judges from past two years made a huge effort to change their work and family commitments to be here this week in person. How wonderful it was to meet people from around the world for the first time that we had only met online in the middle of the night on different time zones just two years ago. And how wonderful it was, again, to see those friends of the Jessup who prior to the pandemic for years would meet here in Washington every year because we believe so strongly in that unofficial motto of the Jessup. In the future, world leaders will look upon each other differently because they met here first as friends. And you, the Jessup competitors of 2023, are truly tomorrow's world leaders, and you've been charged with an immense responsibility. Yes, the Jessup has given you an in-depth education on international law and remarkable legal drafting and advocacy, advocacy skills. Believe me, you are already better lawyers than many lawyers out there who are many years your senior. But the Jessup is so much more than just an educational experience. Its entire purpose is to instill in tomorrow's world leaders an unshakable belief that international disputes can and must be resolved by peaceful means, by what you saw today and what you did this week, by argument, by evidence, and by reason, not by force of arms. What the Jessup really strives to do is to change the lives of each and every one in this room today, because you are the ones that are going to determine what the world is like tomorrow. You are tomorrow's lawyer, professor, diplomat, judge, and political leader, leader who will remember the lessons of the Jessup and insist that disputes between nations be resolved peacefully and in accordance with international law. But even if your path takes you outside of the law, into, the business, into business, the arts, the charity, charitable works, or humanitarian works, or just running your own family, you can use your Jessup skills every single day as a citizen to educate and inspire your fellow citizens in order to create a society in your home countries that insists that political leaders uphold the highest standards of international law and human rights. If you keep these lessons that you've learned from the Jessup this week in your minds, the contacts that you've made here this week in your contact lists on your phones, and the friends that you've made here this week in your hearts, the world is going to be a better place tomorrow. This competition could not have happened with, without the support of so many people, including many of those that Michael has mentioned already. But I do want to take notice of our global partner, Whiting Case, who has been here with a, as a steadfast and passionate supporter of the Global Rounds for so many years. And I want to thank King and Spalding, who has joined the sponsorship of the Jessup this year with incredible enthusiasm as well. And the members of the All Rise Society, the group of donors who have made extraordinary personal contributions of money to the Jessup, I thank you. And I encourage all of you, once you've started earning a paycheck, of course, to consider joining this extraordinary group of financial donors. But any amount of money that you can give over the course of the year to Ilsa is hugely appreciated because that's the only way we can run this competition. To my fellow members, of the ILSA Board of Directors and the Friends of the Jessup, past and present, thank you for being so dedicated to ILSA and supporting the Executive Office, especially, especially during these past three years. There are so many of them that are here, the core group of the Friends of the Jessup, 
and the ILSA Board of Directors, and I would like them to stand to be acknowledged. Go ahead. You know who you are. Thank you. I'd like to also add that Stephen Schneebaum, ILSA's former uh, founding chair of the Board of Directors, will be taking over as chair now that my term has ended. And for those students who have been lucky enough to have Stephen as a judge, as a professor, or have seen him speak in his starring role in the uh, All Rise uh, uh, documentary, uh, know that he is uh, really not just a truly brilliant international lawyer, but an inspirational mentor. Stephen, Ilsa is now back in your caring hands. We've already sung the praises of Ilsa's incredible staff, Stephanie, Shannon, and Chris, and the dedicated core of volunteers, Thais, my friend from Brazil, and Derek Moore. But Michael Pyle, who has probably disappeared somewhere, where is he? He's someone that really, really needs some special recognition. In his more than 20 years of Chessup service, Michael has essentially created the entirety of the Jessup competition architecture you've all experienced. Many of us who have been in the Jessup for almost as long as, uh, as Michael, or the same, um, have chosen the far less stressful path of judging the competition and volunteering as a, a, a board member or a friend of the Jessup, but it's only because of Michael's incredible skills and passion that we have the privilege of doing that. Michael, look around, you did it. And finally, can we just acknowledge what a historic final round this was? I mean, with their excellencies, Sebutinde, Mumba, and Abraham, and the final round competitors. I mean, what an inspiration. Zambia, Uganda, France, China, the Netherlands of various nationalities, <laughs> and women taking the majority uh, in, and the lead in this case, which really just shows. Thank you. This final round shows that the Jessup can make the world an, a more equitable and better place. So now I'm done. Oh no, wait a second, there was something else I had to do and it's the 2024 Jessup problem. I have it right here. The 2024 Jessup problem concerns traitors and crooks. It raises issues related to the right of political expression, statelessness, the right to a nationality, and the scope of the United Nations Security Council's authority in the Pacific settlement of disputes. Hold your breath until September. Get ready and start preparing for the 2024 Jessup. But in the meantime, we're gonna find out who's the 2023 White and Case Global Rounds World Champion. Thank you. We've heard our global partner, White and Case LLP, mentioned several times over the weekend in glowing terms. Um, their attorneys, administrators, staff, and experts permeate the entire Jessup competition. They do the designs, 
They judge our rounds, they administer some of our national rounds and provide support in countless ways. At the apex of uh, the global citizenship and global pro bono uh, leadership uh, sit two, uh, two attorneys who have the vision to invest in the Jessup and invest in using one of the world's great law firms to also make the world a better place. Um, I'd like to acknowledge Jack Pace and I'd like to acknowledge Melissa Butler who are respectively, oh, go ahead, yeah. <laughs> who are respectively the head of uh, the global pro bono practice leader and the head of global citizenship. And one of the things that White and Case has come up with is a brand new award that we suddenly realized after 64, after 61 years, we needed, uh, which is the White and Case uh, Jessup Alumna Lifetime Achievement Award. And so I'd like to ask Melissa to please do the honors. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, first, I'd like to begin by congratulating all of the students who participated in the Jessup competition this year. You know, not only the top two teams uh, who just argued an amazing round, but all the teams who participated. We know how much work goes into this and you should be very proud. So this year marks the 17th year of White and Case's global partnership of the Jessup. As global partner, we're always looking for ways to celebrate and promote the competition and the students who participate. With this in mind, last year we established an award to honor a Jessup alumni who has had an impact on the legal profession and in the wider world. Jessup alumni have gone on to do, have very impressive and important careers, making a difference in the world as lawyers, judges, professors, government officials, and leaders. I firmly believe as do all of us at White and Case, that the next generation of world leaders will emerge from the Jessup community. That is, this is what makes the Jessup and experience the students share here so important. Our hope is that this award will remind you of who are participating today, just how distinguished the members of the alumni community are and inspire you to do great things. For this award, we look for a visionary leader with a commitment to international cooperation the world of law, and the legal profession. And this year, I am delighted to announce that the recipient of the award is Judge Florence Mumba. Judge Mumba is a leading jurist who has made a significant contribution to the study and practice of international law. In 1980, Judge Mumba was the first woman appointed as High Court Judge in Zambia. She represented Zambia on the Conference of Women in 1985 and the African Regional Conference on Women in 1994. As a member of the UN Commission on the Status of Women, she participated in drafting resolution to the General Assembly to have rape included as a war crime in the jurisdiction of war crime tribunals. When Judge Mamba served on the International Commission of Jurists, she participated in drafting the Protocol on African Charter on Human and People's Rights on the establishment of the African Court of Justice in 1995. And in 1997, she was elected judge of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, serving as vice president from 1999 to 2001. And from 2003 to 2005, she served as the Appeals Chamber of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. Judge Mamba is currently serves as a full-time judge at the Supreme Court Chamber of the Extraordinary Chambers of the Courts of Cambodia. The ECCC was established to try senior leaders of the Khmer Rouge for viol alleged violations of international law and serious crimes perpetrated during the Cambodian genocide. Throughout her career, Judge Mumba has fought to improve the law and use it to change the world for better. And I hope you are inspired to bring a similar desire and compassion to your careers. I am deeply honored and humbled to present the White and Case Distinguished Jessup Alumni Award to Judge Florence Mumba. And now very pleased to hear some words from her herself.
Um, thank you very much for this award. Um, I was pleasantly surprised when I received the information because um, I participated in the uh, JSAP competition in 1972. Uh, the University of Zambia Law School decided to participate in this competition. I was then in my final year as a law student. Um, we were of the view that the competition was promising, and uh, our lecturers felt that uh, the competition struck a chord on the development of international law, and they were hopeful that the JSAP competition, international law competition, would uh, progress and grow over the years as it has now done. Um, myself and uh, now Professor Isaac Do uh, teamed up for this auspicious competition in the same way you have done this year, 2023. We were pioneers in that respect, but we deeply believed that the future of the JSAP International Mood Competition um, struck a chord, as I have said, in the development of international law. And we were right, because when you look at the tremendous progress that has been done over the years, that has been achieved over the years up to this year, 2023, is so huge. So many countries have come on board. So many law schools have come on board. And I must say, it's quite a stiff competition. It really calls for the best brains, the best students. So in that way, we are grateful to the organizers of uh, this uh, auspicious competition because it is developing our international lawyers, our future judges, our future counsel before the International Court of Justice, which we respect so much. You are participating in the um, world's largest food court competition. Therefore, consider this. Your presence in this place right now is a setup for greater achievements in your careers. The scope of international law is continuously expanding. The International Court of Justice continues to be loaded by its far-reaching judgments and opinions fostering the importance of peaceful resolution of disputes between states, resolutions which affect um, the citizenry in the states in different ways. For counsel appearing before the International Court of Justice, it is a rewarding experience in that they contribute to the acceptance of universal values which are now seeping through global populations as, the, uh, as we tackle human rights financial stability, and coexistence in all the regions of the world. As JSAP competitors, you are learning skills in interpretation and drafting of treaties, conventions, multilateral agreements, and advocacy, ad advocacy skills that will forge you into successful lawyers. The complex JSAP world competition provides a forum for skillful training and drives students towards excellence as they judge. When I'm sitting as a judge, I enjoy adjudicating cases in which the parties are well prepared, daringly skilled, and precise in their knowledge of the law, and they are logical in thought and word. Jessup Moot Court Apply just of mood court competitions, apply international law as we find it, giving competitors the edge over those who do not participate in these competitions. Indeed, these are trials for both lawyers and judges. More importantly, as legal practitioners in training, I urge you to believe in yourself, your abilities, and maintain a drive for the will to, to, to earn you a deserved place in the legal fraternity. Worldwide, you must therefore always be careful about the substance of your work, 
always aspire to inspire others and properly conduct yourselves, engage with rigor and have a deep understanding of international law, integrity, ethics, mutual respect for your colleagues and others, and a strong sense of duty will help sustain you. You will be filled with desire and dedication to impact the world, winning the cause of justice and upholding the rule of law. Questions, the question which is, which is before you now is this. Are you going to be an asset or, an ability, or a liability in our profession? The answer lies in your daily commitment and obligations, whether in interacting in a wider sphere or in your home countries, assisting state governments in positioning themselves as drivers of peace and human development towards positive neighborliness as humanity forges ahead. I wish you all success. Thank you for listening. And at long last, there's only one piece of business left. So let's sit and wait while the judges make their way into the room. The bailiff will announce all rise. Judges will come into the room and we will find out which of these two teams takes the Jessup, home, Jessup Cup home to their, to their countries, no matter who wins, for the first time. Good luck. Please be seated. The court meets to deliver the judgment in the case after the shortest deliberation in history. <laughs> now normally um, at the ICJ, we will be deciding on the issues and the merits of the case. As you know, this is not really about the merits of this case. It's about uh, other benchmarks, which I will briefly tell you about. Now, this case had a wide variety of issues. Um, <laughs> within, you know, which, which issues you had to cover within a very limited time. So the judges looked for a number of benchmarks in order to help us determine which was the better performer of the finalists. So the first of which was uh, the ability of counsel to narrow down the key issues and to target counsel's arguments appropriately. You, you couldn't possibly be expected to, to cover all the arguments and all the, key, the issues uh, raised by in, in the fact sheet. So that was one of the aspects we looked at the ability to narrow down the issues and to address those in, in, in view of your limited time. The second was we looked at the knowledge uh, of counsel of the applicable law, including the court's jurisprud jurisprudence, and to be able to relate that to the issues that you are arguing. The third aspect was the ability to manage one's time in covering as many key issues as possible. And I think you all did superbly on that account. Uh, we also looked at the ability uh, of counsel to answer the judge's questions on your feet and uh, the ability not to be derailed by the questions. Of course, the secret is for you to remain confident even, even if you're not sure of the answer that you're giving. You must look confident and then be able to resume your arguments and keep within the time. So those were a few uh, of the benchmarks that we followed. Uh, there, were, there were others, but I will not go into those. And um, my colleagues and I uh, did not find it easy to come to a decision, because as you can imagine, by the time you reach the finals, both teams are neck and neck 
in performance. And it was not easy for us to choose the winner because you both teams, teams did very, very well. I can see you're wait waiting. I was expecting you to clap for yourselves because you did very, very well. <laughs> Sincerely. Which brings me to the final verdict. We would like to announce um, our unanimous decision that the best oralist, drum roll, <laughs> is Miss Alia Squali Pisoni. And the winner of this year's moot competition are the respondents from the state of Ghana. So congratulations uh, to both teams and especially to the winning team.